and I'm the director of the society. Uh, and I'm delighted actually to introduce David Lefman tonight, who is a fellow. And in fact, this is our second time that we've had you speak. The first time was on William Mesny, the um, British adventurer in China. And um, just to tell you a little bit about David, of course, he's written actually numerous books on, on diverse topics, from travel books to a, a book on William Mesny as well, uh, a Chinese cookbook. Ghost write that. <laughs> <laughs> right. And now we have um, the lecture tonight, which is on Chinese woodblock prints, which was also um, a subject of a book that I think you published 2020, just, just last year, 2022, uh, called Paper Horses. So this is a really interesting uh, topic, and um, from all sor sorts of points of view, as we just had in the conversation that I was just overhearing about how these de designs move, and like, we were talking exactly about the same thing as well with this parallels with textiles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm just going to hand over to you, and off we go. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Alison. Also, thanks to Matty Bradley for giving me technical assistance here tonight. And uh, uh, thank you for inviting me here uh, for the uh, during the uh, RAS's two uh, bicentennial. Um, well, I first became interested in uh, woodblock printing when I was still at school, about 1980. Uh, I went to the Bristol Museum. They had an exhibition of uh, Japanese woodblock prints, of course. And then uh, I was sort of so taken with that artistry, I actually taught myself how to make woodblock prints when I was still at school. So I've been uh, designing and cutting them uh, on and off since then. But it was uh, the mid, uh, I suppose 1995, something like that. I was in China as a travel writer. It's in the southern city of Guangzhou. And I came across these two prints. These are door gods and they go up either side of the door. And as I found out later, that the um, heavy orange background, uh, but particularly the red and green uh, contrasting on the body, is very typical of the southern studios, and particularly a nearby town called Foshan. And uh, you'll hear a lot about Foshan and about door gods later on in the talk. I've also got a lot of maps later on that you just have to bear with me at the moment. Uh, Anyway, these were the first two woodblocks I ever bought. Uh, then I picked them up wherever I found them in China. I bought them at auction overseas. I've got quite a collection now. And studying them, I suppose, has uh, taught me a lot about not just woodblock printing and Chinese art in general, but also, as you'll see tonight, uh, as something of a window into other aspects of Chinese culture, um, particularly folk religion, um, folk law, history, and even a bit of uh, specialist language. Uh, I suppose I should kick off by saying what a woodblock print is. Uh, well, woodblock printing is a way of mass producing a picture or a text. You draw your design on a piece of translucent paper, um, and then you find a, a, a woodblock. It's just a plank of wood <laughs> that's the right size for, the, uh, for your design. There's no fixed size for these. They range from a few centimeters to over a meter across. Most of the ones you'll see tonight, they're about, I suppose, 30 by 50 centimeters, something like that. So you take your design, you paste it face down onto the wood block, because uh, it's going to print the other way around in reverse. And then you cut through the paper into the wood using chisels, gouges, knives, whatever. Um, and you cut away everything except the design. And this leaves, as you can see here, the design standing proud of the wooden background. And that's your wood block. So to make a print, you ink it, you, you ink up the block, you lay a sheet of paper on top, and then you rub the back of the paper to transfer the ink. So the ink's uh, transferred by pressure, not by absorption. And there's real skill to putting just the right quantity of ink on the block. If you don't use enough, you get a very dry, faint, fuzzy image. If you use too much, you get blotches. Or worse than that, the paper will tear. It'll stick to the wood block, and when you peel it off, you get holes in the paper. And this is pretty much what's happened here. This is another door god. This one's from Eastern China. If you look pretty much in the center, if I can use this, yep, it's around there. You'll see some irregularly shaped white holes, and that's where the paper is stuck to the wood block and then torn away uh, when it's been removed. 
So the simplest designs to print are just a black and white outline. And I've seen uh, printers do about 10 of those a minute when they go full pelt. But uh, most of the prints you'll see tonight, they're, they're colored. And making multicolored print is a bit more complicated. So to start off, you have to make a different wood block for each color. So this one's got four colors and black. So it's actually taken five wood blocks. You've had to cut five separate blocks of wood. And this is a setup just for printing the red on that picture there. And the other thing that slows it down is obviously the, the color that you're adding has to print in exactly the right place. It can't go sort of too high or too low. So you can only do that by making very carefully positioning the paper, registering the paper with the wood block uh, so that it does print in the right place. And it's just one of these things that slows the whole process down. Now the wood blocks themselves, this bit here, uh, they do wear out through use, even though they're just being printed on paper. Uh, they can split and warp and all the fine detail eventually breaks off. But if you've um, kept some of the early prints you've made that have still got all the details still on it, you can actually use these woodblock prints to make a new block, to cut a new block in exactly the same way that you made the original one. You take one of the prints, you lay it face down on the woodblock and you cut through the back in the same way. And you end up with a new woodblock that's still got all the details. And in this way, the same design can be passed down through centuries. There are ones in my collection, though they're modern, the designs were drawn uh, in the Ming Dynasty, that's 500 years ago. Um, so, this is um, actually a, a woodblock of the kitchen god and his wife that has worn away a bit. Um, it's not in too bad conditions. In the same way, in fact, if you've uh, made a commercially successful print, then a rival studio can steal it off you simply by buying up some of your prints and using them to cut their own woodblocks. Uh, so it can be very difficult to know where a uh, print is from just from what it shows and just, uh, yeah. So woodblock printing was actually invented in China. The dates keep changing. I think at the moment it seems to be before the uh, 8th century. Um, and they were originally uh, for mass producing uh, Buddhist uh, texts, probably as devotional, uh, for devotional reasons, or possibly just to make sure that a whole string of monasteries had exactly the same text. But the oldest uh, woodblock printed picture is this one. This is uh, from a long scroll of the Buddhist Diamond Sutra, it's actually just down the road in the British Museum. And because of what it says elsewhere on the scroll, we know that this print was made on the 11th of May, 868 AD. But the, the block is very, the picture's very technically complex and it would have taken a lot of skill to cut that wood block. So it's fairly safe to assume that wood block printed pictures have been around for a while before this one was made. But the industry, uh, sort of an industry for mass producing uh, prints for sale to the public, for public use, well, that sprung up during the Song Dynasty, and that's the sort of prints I'm going to be talking about tonight. So the Song Dynasty, 960 to 1279. And this painting by uh, Li Song, made around 1200, uh, is generally held to be the earliest visual evidence for the use of woodblock prints. So this is of a family celebrating the new year inside their mansion. And if you look down there at the bottom, you can see there's a picture of a door god stuck up there. And either side of the main hall where the family are having their meal, there's another door god there and there. So this is the early 13th century. Well, by the 19th century, there wouldn't have been a town in China that didn't have a woodblock printing studio or two. And they were churning out just countless millions of prints a year. That's quite literally the truth. Um, the, the streets must have been knee deep in waste paper during the 19th century. The individual uh, regions developed very distinctive printing styles. And some of these prints were marketed right around China. So in the late 19th century in Beijing, there were shops selling prints that had come from the south of the country, it's 2000 kilometers away. And at the same time, they were making prints in the Beijing area with no human figures in them. And these were specifically for export to northwestern China, which is Muslim. But unfortunately, this whole industry began to go into a decline after the 1840s as China entered a rather sad century of foreign invasions and civil war. 
So we look at the town of Suzhou in eastern China, a nice canal town near Shanghai. And in the 18th and early 19th century, this was probably one of the main hubs of woodblock printing in China. They're making very technically complicated prints like this one. This is the happiness of fishermen. And it is, I think, my favorite uh, woodblock print of all time, uh, partly because of this beautiful rhythmic composition with the waves and the incredible skill that's gone into carving such fine lines in that print. But also because over here on the uh, right-hand side, just uh, use this, um, oh, oh, there we go. You can see people fishing with tame cormorants. And this takes me back to my early years in China in the 1980s and 1990s, where it was still quite a common sight in uh, the countryside. But anyway, Suzhou, the city where this was made, completely destroyed in 1864 at the end of the Taiping Uprising. And with it went all the woodblock printing studios. Now, some of them did set up again afterwards, but you can see there's a, quite a drop off in the quality of prints. And it's clear that a lot of the old woodblocks would have been destroyed. And also probably a lot of the old masters with all the skills have been killed. And then from the late 19th century, of course, you had competition with modern mechanical ways of printing, such as lithography, which are much faster and cheaper, particularly for color. And then there were more civil wars. There was the Japanese invasion in 1930s. Uh, there was the Second World War. And then, of course, in the 60s, there was the Cultural Revolution. And all these things really put an end to uh, commercial woodblock printing in China. Since the 1980s, though, there have been regular attempts to restart the industry. Um, woodblock prints have made it onto sets of commemorative stamps like these and they've been granted intangible cultural heritage status. But the truth is there just isn't a demand for these old prints anymore, and the studios can't sell the vast numbers they need to sell in order to turn the living. Uh, some of them are still going, some of the studios and workshops are still going, but it's because they've turned themselves more into folk craft museums and sell their prints in limited numbers as tourist souvenirs or even sort of pricey collectible artworks. Right, that is plenty of background information. So we'll go straight into the, probably the best known type of uh, traditional woodblock print, Nianhua, or New Year pictures, like this. Now, uh, the term Nianhua, New Year pictures, does tend to get overused nowadays uh, for all the traditional woodblock prints. But really it was for these sort of bright, cheerful, auspicious prints that people put up at New Year uh, to decorate the house decorate the home, and a lot of them are rebuses. They contain a lot of hidden meanings and puns. And this is quite a straightforward one. The Chinese at the top there reads da ji, which means uh, great good fortune. If you say it slightly differently, uh, it sounds like da ji, which means giant chicken. So that's why there's a giant chicken here. Um, there's a boy sitting on the chicken's back, and he's holding a ruyi, which is a magic wishing wand. So the very broad meaning of this print is wishing for the great good fortune of having sons. Uh, this print's naive qualities and very bright and bold design and the color scheme in uh, red, purple, green, and yellow, very typical of the studios at Jusianjian, which is a town in Henan province. Now they claim that they're the oldest surviving woodlot printing center in China. They've been making prints there since the, uh, I think the 15th, possibly the 16th century. In 2007, they held a workshop, which I managed to get to. I was given, I was shown how to print properly. And I also bought a lot more print, <laughs> a lot more prints, uh, including this one. This is another one of these Rebus prints, but it's a bit more complicated than the last one. So these things here, these sort of insect-like things, they're actually red bats. Uh, which is Hongfu in Chinese, which sounds like you're saying abundant good fortune. Now over here, this tray is a model or a little miniature Song Dynasty official and a deer. Now deers normally are a stand-in for longevity in Chinese art, but here it's a pun on the word for deer, lü, and the similar sounding word for an official salary. And this idea of um, rank and the salary it brings is reinforced by the rider's robes 
uh, which are of uh, top level civil servant. He's got another one of these uh, Ruyi wishing ones, and he's on horseback, Ma Shan in Chinese, which is how you say coming quickly. If you're in a restaurant and you wonder where your food's gone and you ask the waiter, he'll go, Ma Shan, Ma Shan, just coming. So if you put all of this stuff together, you get a meaning something like wishing for the speedy arrival of uh, rank, uh, wealth, and longevity, and abundant good fortune. So now we're moving to another town, Yangqing, which is probably the most important woodblock center in the late 19th century. In fact, some of the artists who were in Suzhou over here when it was destroyed in the 1860s actually relocated to Yangqing and helped, helped them set up some studios there. And Yangqing is just to the west of Tianjin City, about 130 kilometers from Beijing. And this shows uh, episodes from the legend of White Snake, which is a popular folktale about a scholar who falls in love with a mysterious and beautiful woman, one of these, who of course turns out to be a snake spirit in human form. Um, at one point in the story, the scholar gets kidnapped by this Buddhist monk. But anyway, after lots of adventures, the lovers are reunited. Now, typically for Yang Luqing, it's quite a busy print, it's very detailed. And when you compare it to the ones from Zhu Xianzhen, <clears throat> it's quite realistically handled. It's also enormous, <clears throat> it's over a meter across, which is about the technical limit for color woodblock prints. But in fact, the outline and some of the base colors were woodblock printed, but in fact, most of the color here has been painted on by hand. Again, this is very typical of the Yang Luqing studios. Uh, when, I, when I talk about the studios or workshops of a place, what you would have had is a, within the town, there would have been a district where all these woodblock prints were made by separate family-run businesses, all making their own prints. But they would have employed specialists such as, um, well, the original artists, people to cut the woodblocks, people to print them, and the people to do the overpainting and so forth. And these skills were handed down either through the family or by apprenticeships. It was very, very unusual for any one person to have a handle on the entire woodblock printing production process, except, so heading down to Southern China now and Foshan, the town of Foshan, just to the west of Guangzhou uh, yeah, city, uh, not very far from Hong Kong, in fact. Now I spoke about Foshan earlier in connection with those two orange back door god prints right at the beginning. The title of this print would be something like Heaven Sent Money Pouring In. Now, I couldn't talk about folk prints without mentioning wealth gods because they're an incredibly important topic. And up here, you've got the immortal Liu Hai uh, arriving above this uh, house at New Year on his three-legged money toad, this thing here. And the toad is well, he's literally vomiting out uh, silver, gold, and precious stones over this young couple, and these servants here are collecting it all in a, in a basket. Now, as I, it, this doesn't have that strong orange background, but it does have this strong contrasting red and green color scheme with a bit of yellow there um, that's very typical of these southern studios. Now, if you look just there on the side of the building, there's two Chinese characters, and they effectively mean that this painting, this picture was drawn by a man called Jun. And his full name was Feng Jun, and he was one of the best known uh, woodblock printing, well, his studio is one of the best known ones in Foshan in the first half of the 20th century. But it got destroyed during the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s, and Feng, Bingtang, uh, Feng Jun was forced out of business, and he ended up spending the rest of his life working in the construction industry. He died in 1989, and after that, his son, uh, Feng Bingtang, uh, started up the business again. And it turned out that they'd hidden some of the old woodblocks from the, cult, from the Red Guards during the Cultural Revolution. So he got the business going again with those. And then he started designing his own prints, and uh, some of them are on the back wall there, the Plum Blossom Boys. Um, so out of necessity, Mr. Fong here was one of the very rare people who did master all aspects of the woodblock printing industry. Um, when I met him in 2019, 
he told me that about a century ago, there were something like 100 studios, woodblock printing studios in Foshan. They employed, let's say, 1,000 people, and they exported their prints into all through southern China into Taiwan and through the Chinese communities in Southeast Asia. And I've seen the city accounts for 1934. It brought in something like 13 or 14,000 ounces of silver to the city that year. So it's quite a considerable industry. But in 2019, Mr. Fong's studio was the very last one. And sadly, he died not long afterwards. But I believe his uh, son and he had a disciple who, is, who are carrying on the trade. They're still going. Heading back to northern China, the town of Wuqiang, for this next one. It's another quite large print. It's probably about so big, 80 centimeters across. I got it at a flea market in Beijing in 2016. And this sort of narrative, cartoon-like uh, uh, setup is very typical for the Wuqiang studios. And this shows uh, the early life of the great 12th century uh, patriot, Yu Fei, uh, who defended China, the Song Dynasty, from uh, the uh, Jurchen, who were northerners trying to invade China. So over here, it's got Yu Fei as a baby and his mother being rescued from a flood and adopted into a wealthy household. And then this is him as a very young man beating up the local bully. Here he's making some friends, fighting some battles down here. And this panel here, his mother is having him tattooed with the characters for serve the nation with the utmost loyalty. Uh, now, the rest of his story isn't quite as good, unfortunately. Uh, his success in battle was actually the cause of his downfall because there were factions at the Song court that wanted the war with the Jurchen to be continued. And so on the point of victory, he was recalled. He was falsely implicated in a trumped up charge and executed for treason. But then 20 years later, his reputation was restored and he had this great tomb built for him. And it's flanked by kneeling iron figures of the corrupt officials who falsely denounced him. And these were there so people could show their contempt by spitting on them, throwing rubbish at them, even urinating on them. Um, and this isn't actually at his tomb. This is at his temple at Jusianjian, the, the uh, printing center I was talking about. He's a local hero there because he fought a lot of his campaigns in the, in the region. So now we're off to the Shandong Peninsula and the town of Weifang. And the next print was made by the Weifang Nianhua Print Workshop in about 1980 to celebrate, I think, their centenary. And I, I like this workshop's prints. They, they work to a very high standard, technical standard indeed. Beautiful uh, fine line work and very accurate color printing. But unfortunately, due to a copyright issue over their name, uh, they were actually closed down. So it's a bit mundane. Anyway, this shows uh, an episode from the great historical novel, The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and it's set as an opera scene. Now, the story of the Three Kingdoms takes place in about 220 uh, AD, when the Han Dynasty collapsed and China was split into three competing kingdoms, each vying for supremacy. Um, and it's a fantastically well-known story today, even though the, the novel was written in about the 15th century. But it's in some ways a bit like Shakespeare, that even if you haven't read it all the way through, or any of it for that matter, You'll, you'll know some of the stories from it. You'll have read comics as a child. You might have seen um, uh, TV series or films, seen an opera even. There are famous sayings that come from the novel. There's even a couple of folk gods uh, that have uh, originated in the story. And what I really like about it, even though it's a tale of civil war, it's not really about great battles and bloodshed and slaughter. Every episode centers around how you can use strategy and cunning to defeat your enemy. And this is a classic example. The Chinese up here says the empty city stratagem. And up here, you've got the master strategist of the novel, Kong Ming. And he's got to defend this city, Sichang, uh, from an invading army, but he doesn't have enough troops. So he goes to the battlements and he sits there and gets his men to open the gates beneath an apparent surrender. 
And he took this risk because he knew that the invading general, Sumayi, in his youth had been this incredibly brave, fierce fighter, but he was getting on a bit in years and he'd become very, very cautious. And sure enough, Sumayi drew up his army in front of the city. He saw Kongming sitting calmly on the battlements, the gates flung open to, as if to welcome him. And he knew how cunning Kong Ming was, and he couldn't believe he would take a risk like this unless he had some plan and cunning scheme. He was convinced he was riding into an ambush, so he turned his army around and fled. So without even drawing uh, his sword, Kong Ming was able to save the city and escape. The next print, uh, this is also from Wei Feng, very different studio, you can see from the style there. And it's a children's story, really, about the rat family looking for the best match for their daughter. And after considering all the options, they decide that cats are the most powerful creatures, so they're going to marry their daughter to a cat. And off they go to arrange the wedding. And as you can imagine, it really doesn't end well. The Chinese at the top there reads uh, something like, a misfortunate rat got married in town. The groom was a cat who swallowed her down. And it's really a, a cautionary tale about the dangers of social climbing. Um, the cat represents a rapacious official. And obviously the, the moral there is, if you've got something of value, don't brag about it, keep it hidden or the government will come along and take it off you. And this sort of social commentary ties in with this next print, uh, which is also here because it shows that not all these uh, New Year pictures were uh, taken from uh, history or folk tales. They can also occasionally comment on contemporary uh, happenings, contemporary events. Now, from the late 19th century onwards, there was a huge power struggle in China between uh, conservative and reformist factions. And the reformers won. In 1912, the emperor was forced to abdicate and the Chinese Republic was sworn in. And this print is very much of that moment. The old China has been sort of abandoned, the conservative ways have gone, and here they are opening up to the world, and they're going to invite all this new technology in and modernize the country. So up here you've got aeroplanes, uh, telegraphs, electricity, I think these are traffic lights as well. Here you've got a tram, got a rickshaw that's come from Japan, bicycles, foreign style clothing, foreign influenced architecture, and also a very foreign artistic technique, uh, linear perspective moving to this vanishing point. Now, the, the title of this print is a true and complete picture of Sichuan, but it's not Sichuan province in southwestern China, famous for its spicy food. It's Sichuan Road in Shanghai, where presumably you could see all these wonders at the same time. But the cityscape here, the buildings, this is actually not Shanghai. It's a, uh, a city called Tianjin, um, which is about 500 kilometers away. This is Tianjin's uh, fire station. And here, this is the bell tower, Tianjin's bell tower, which is actually still there today. So why has the artist used Tianjin? Well, because he stole it from another print. He, he, the cityscape was used in a, a print from Tianjin, and this, this artist just stole it and then added all the modern stuff make his own print. And it just shows that simply by looking at a print, you can never be too sure about all the details involved. So we're going to leave uh, Nian Hua, the New Year pictures now, and move on to another type of print, which I guess would be oh wait, um, pr prints of protection. Probably the best known of these are door gods. You've already seen quite a few of these things. Um, those two orange back ones right at the beginning, they're stuck up either side of a, a house doorway to really to keep out anything evil from coming into the household. Now, this idea actually comes from Indian art. Um, in fact, there's sculptures outside Indian Hindu temples and Buddhist temples, and they probably came into China uh, with Buddhism in the first century. And some of the old Buddhist temples in China still have these huge guardian figures either side of the entrance. They're called Hung and Ha. I don't know which one this is, but there's be another one the other side of it. So even though this is an Indian idea, foreign idea, it was absorbed into Chinese culture and turned into something entirely Chinese, prints of door gods. And it, they even got a Chinese story to explain their origin. So going back right to the beginning of the Tang Dynasty in the early seventh century, 
The first emperor, Taizong, he'd done a lot of nasty things to get to the top, he was plagued by nightmares. Um, so in order to get a good night's sleep, he got two of his fearsome generals, real people incidentally, called Qin Qiong and uh, Yu Chukong, and he put them in full battle armor either side of his, his bedroom doorway. And this was uh, to keep out the evil spirits that had been giving him nightmares, and it worked. The ghosts were so scared of these two generals, they, they let the emperor alone, he got a good night's sleep. But obviously, they couldn't stay there every night. So he had the court painter paint their portraits on the doors, and this worked just as well. And then the idea spread out into the wider population, and these two real people uh, were, as you can see, deified in the end as door gods. So you've got um, Yu Chukong is here on the left. Now, his face is normally completely red, and this is to do with fierce martial vigor. And Qin Tiong on the right here, he's normally got a completely white face, which is more about wisdom and diplomacy. But here, for some reason, the artist has given them 50-50 to balance their personalities. Now, this print is actually um, from Jusian Zhen, the first place that I spoke about, but prints almost identical to this are found all over China. Another very popular guardian figure in China are tigers. Um, this is one of two prints that would have gone either side of a doorway. Now, in some places in China, they put them on the front doors of houses to keep foxes out. Um, and the reason for this is foxes are red, they've got long flaming tails, houses are built of wood, and it's believed that fox spirits uh, cause house fires. So by pasting these outside, they become talismans against your house burning down. The tigers have a very odd position in Chinese culture because obviously they're really dangerous creatures uh, and they were quite common in the Chinese countryside until about 100 years ago. But their strength and ferocity is also believed to drive away evil spirits, uh, particularly ones that bring illness. So at least in Chinese art, they're very popular guardian figures. And so a print like this, or a pair of them might have gone up in a sick room or they even sometimes pinned to children's clothing. And then the children would be given a little tiger hat and tiger shoes to wear, and this would stop them from getting ill, or well, the idea was to stop them from getting ill. And there's also another bit of wordplay here, because the Chinese for tiger, hu, sounds very similar to the hu, which means to protect. And here you go, another tiger. This is uh, the Taoist patriarch, Zhang Daoling, riding a tiger that is suppressing the disease-bringing five poisons uh, represented by a toad, a snake, a centipede, a lizard, and a spider. Um, now, Zhang Daoling was a real person. I don't know if he rode tigers, but he was a real person. Uh, he was born in AD 34. And he founded his Taoist sect in the mountains of northern Sichuan province in southwestern China. But his followers eventually relocated a long way away to eastern China, a place called Longhoshan, Dragon Tiger Mountain. And this became a hub of Taoism in China, the Taoist religion, for about, well, over a thousand years, in fact. This was a major center for Taoism in China. And the mountain became completely covered in temples, including one called the Shangqing Gong, the Shangqing Palace. And they would have issued talismans like this to, as a bit of a money spinner, the temple. Now, these symbols at the top here, this is the uh, Zhang Daoling seals and seal of the temple. This is a yin yang bagua sign. This is a talismanic character. And these little tick marks also have talismanic power. And the idea is they all repel evil. And the Chinese reads the seal of the great, uh, of the great Shangqing Palace, Long Hushan, Dragon Tiger Mountain, Jiangxi Province. And talismans like this would have been of most uh, used the most uh, during the Duanwu Festival, which is the fifth of the fifth lunar month. Probably just been, in fact. Um, it's known nowadays for the dragon boat races. But in the old days, it was also considered the least healthy day of the year because it's stinking hot in most of China. And these disease bringing five poisons are at their most noxious. Now, because of a, a letter that came with this print, I know it was actually made at Shanghai in 1927. So here you've got the story of this print stretching all the way across China. 
from uh, the mountains of Sichuan province, where um, Zhang Daoling founded his sect, to Longshan Dragon Tiger Mountain, with all the temples where the sect flourished, and then finally to Shanghai, where the print, that print was made, even though it's been issued in the name of uh, the Shangqing Gong, Shangqing Palace at Longhushan. Uh, 1927 was a really terrible year for folk religion in China because the government banned it uh, in no uncertain terms. In fact, they said the statues, the idols should be torn down and smashed and the temples sma uh, again smashed and turned to rubble so that nothing remains. And this really was a declaration of open season on these rural temples in the middle of nowhere with no protection, full of uh, valuable religious artifacts. And uh, bandits and local militias started raiding them. And in fact, in 1929 and 1930, all the temples at Longhushan were destroyed, including the Shangqing Palace. If you look at this version of the same print that was made in 1930, it no longer mentions Shanting Palace. It just says the great Taoist of uh, Dragon Tiger Mountain. Now, the next print is returning to Sichuan. Different place, though, Mingshan. And Mingshan is a hillside on the north bank of the Yangtze River, and it's covered in temples dedicated to uh, the god of the afterlife, Tianzi. And this is actually his main temple there, uh, Tianzi Dian. And you'll notice that his guardian lion outside the temple actually has a skull on its necklace there. If you just died in the old days in China, you needed one of these. This is an afterlife passport. And it's so you it can get past Tianzi's guardians into the afterlife. Without it, you might be stuck in a sort of twilight zone which you have to roam indefinitely as uh, what they called a hungry ghost. So it would have originally, well, it had been intended to be buried or burned with the, uh, with the body. And there's a couple of religions in China, uh, Taoism and uh, Buddhism. And this is a Buddhist version of the print, the Buddhist trinity here, and the Buddhist Pure Land sects mantra here. Um, I've seen Taoist versions of the same passport. They've got an immortal riding a bird and a different bit of text here. So we're going to move on to a completely different type of print. I suppose they'd be called prints of patronage. Because in another very, very popular, ubiquitous type of print in the old days, because every aspect of your life was overseen by a patron deity, everything from birth, uh, childhood, um, your profession, even of deities of toilets. There were thousands and thousands of Chinese gods, popular gods. Um, and they, these prints of these gods would have been put up at, in a place and a time appropriate to each one. So I'm just going to cover a couple of them because obviously I can't do a thousand tonight. Um, and this, this print is from Yang Wuqing, the uh, place I covered earlier on in the talk where all the prints are hand colored. And it shows the immortal uh, archer, Zhang Yun Xiao, and he's uh, driving off this creature here, the black heavenly hound. And it's a very nasty creature. It devours male infants in the womb. And Zhang is using a bow, but he's not firing arrows. He's firing uh, slingshot pellets. And that's because if you say in Chinese, firing pellets, song zi, it's exactly the same as saying sending children. Uh, he's a fertility deity, and that explains all these children around his waist, and also the protective tiger here to guard them. Um, and there's a print, or probably a couple of them, would be put up in, well, in the bedroom of a newlywed, newlywed's bedroom, uh, really to encourage them to sort of get on with things, start producing children. So quite a blatant uh, use of a woodblock print. So moving down to Hangzhou a town fairly close again to Shanghai in eastern China. Um, and this next print shows uh, Du Kang, very popular deity in China for some reason, the god of wine. Um, now, a print like this would be put up in a, a wine shop or by a brewers or distillers uh, on Du Kang's birthday. Fortunately, I can't remember when that was, but also at New Year. Now, it's a woodblock printed image. The outline has been woodblock printed, but all the colors have been put on using stencils. 
This is the only region in China that uses stencils, probably because it's a terrible technique for the Chinese paper. It causes a lot of bleeding and it becomes very difficult to see what the print is of. But this is Du Kang. Um, this is his assistant here. And either side here and here, there's some jars of wine and some more down the bottom. Now here, two couplets either side. And they read, on opening the jar, the fragrance spreads for 10 miles. From house to house, all three generations get drunk. There's a really nice print. I do like this one. <laughs> okay. At, <laughs> so at last, I've been, I've been skirting around this place. Beijing, we're going to Beijing. We're a completely different type of print again. As I said, there are thousands and thousands of folk gods in Chinese, uh, Chinese popular religion. And this next type of print are called Zhema. And Zhema are sort of small, square, squarish prints of folk deities. And you use them to uh, ask favors from benevolent deities or maybe ask for protection from malevolent ones. Now, the word Zhema means paper horse. And this is a fantastic name, in my opinion, because these prints were usually after the ceremony, but it was performed, they'd be burned, and you have this cloud of smoke galloping heavenwards, carrying your prayer with it. So I think it's a really nice name. Now, about uh, three or four years ago, I bought a collection of 80 of these prints, and I could easily talk for an hour just on them. But luckily for everybody here tonight, I whittled it down to just one, and this is it. Um, and this is the Lord of Thunder, Lady of Lightning. Now, the Lord of Thunder is this weird creature here, monkey-bodied, vulture-faced, surrounded by a ring of flying drums that he, he beats with a mallet and chisel. His wife, Lady Lightning, she's holding up two flaming mirrors, and next to her is a rain, a rain deity who's got a vase of water that he sprinkles over the land with um, a willow twig. Now, these prints were made in vast numbers at incredible speed, which explains why they hadn't, uh, there's no quality control and they've missed the paper with the bottom of the block. So, what's down here? There's a dragon here. There was another dragon here as well, being ridden by two immortals. Dragons always associated with water in Chinese law, so clouds, rain, rivers. And one aspect of this print is very much agricultural. Um, Thunder's birthday. Uh, the 24th of the sixth lunar month. And farmers might have burned a print like this to pray to him and say, please don't destroy my crops, which are just about to ripen. Don't have a summer storm, please. But also, strangely, he was a minor medical deity, able to cure aches and pains, toothache and that sort of thing. So it's possible that even in an urban setting, people would have been after a print like this one. Now, as I said, there's a set of 80 from Beijing. In the old days, these paper horses were used all over China, just everywhere, by everybody. The only place they're still in use, as far as I'm aware, is right down in the southwestern corner of China in Yunnan province. And just outside the town of Dali, I went to the studio of a, another artist called uh, Zhang Relong, who didn't die just after I visited him. I'm not a, I'm not a curse on artists. Um, so he still makes these traditional prints for everyday festivals. He makes them in vast numbers, but they are so incredibly cheap that he can't make a living from selling them. So what he's done, he's one of these people who's turned his uh, part of his studio into a sort of folk culture museum. And he makes probably better quality uh, prints to sell as souvenirs at higher prices to people like me. And this is one of them. Now, this type of print does have a serious purpose, which we'll get down to in a minute, but actually it's a bit of a, a joke about the local accent. So I said before, in, in Mandarin Chinese, this type of print is called a paper horse, which is Zerma, but the local accent pronounces it Jama, which in Mandarin sounds as if you're saying armored horse, which is why it says in Chinese at the top armored horse, and why you have a horse in chainmail galloping through the skies. But there were armored horse prints as well. They had lots of uses in, in traditional folklore. And one of them was as a talisman for protection on long journeys. They usually show a horse and a soldier in chainmail. 
Um, and the horse is to get you to your destination quickly and the soldier to make sure you get there in, in safety. So a talisman for protection on, on your travels. And these two, these are also paper horse prints. Uh, they're from the same region, but right against China's far southwestern corner, the border with Burma. And these are twin uses there. These four figures down here are wealth deities. And these are the twin deities of harmony. And these prints are always put up in pairs, um, usually on the front of a house. This is either side of the front door of a house to invite, uh, this is at New Year, to invite the gods of wealth to enter your home and also domestic harmony. Actually, the implication up here is, is specifically marital harmony, but domestic harmony anyway. So these are outside a house. However, I've also seen them on public transport in the area, on taxis, and here above the door of a, a country bus. Now, if there's anybody here who's been on a country bus in China, you'll know that arguments over the fare are pretty common. And also there are quite frequently punch-ups between the passengers at one point or another. So putting up uh, gods of wealth over the door, well, so everybody has a profitable journey. And the gods of harmony, probably so you won't argue with the conductor over the fare and you'll keep your fists to yourself. So the very last type of print I'm going to talk about is totally different. Uh, from any of them so far, and they have a bearing on the end of woodblock printing in China, so sort of appropriate here. They're called victory prints, and they have a very strange origin. They have a, um, the origin is in a set of 14 copper plate engravings that were actually, although designed in China, they were actually made in France for the Qianlong Emperor in the mid-18th century. And they celebrated his campaigns against the tribes along China's western borders, the Tibetans and Burmese and so forth. But at some point, knowledge of these prints must have seeped out of the, out of the palace to Shanghai, where this next print is made, because a whole series of prints, victory prints, made using woodblocks suddenly started and remained in vogue for about 50 years. And they always show a really vigorous battle scene and a sort of punchy tabloid-like headline at the top there. And they're very much served as new sheets for a largely illiterate Chinese population. So if you can imagine this handed round in a crowd or stuck up on a wall, uh, somebody who could read would read the title and everybody else could just enjoy the sight of China's forces thrashing the enemy. Unfortunately though, as far as I can gather, uh, I've never seen a print that depicted a real victory. They're always fictitious. And the story behind this one is that in 1894, uh, China and Japan went to war over control of Korea. China lost. And part of the settlement was that they had to hand over the island of Taiwan to Japan. And this really didn't go down well with the Chinese who happened to be living in Taiwan at the time. And they organized resistance against the Japanese occupation, which was led by a man called Liu Yongfu, who had his own Horses, the black flags. So at the top here, it says Liu Yongfu's black flag soldiers defend Taiwan. Uh, victory by, well, by land and sea, land and water. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, though, it's fake news. Uh, Liu Yongfu was defeated. And in fact, he only managed to escape because he dressed as a woman and then got aboard a British registered vessel, which the Japanese couldn't take him off. And the, well, the consequences of this type of print, they became so popular that they actually influenced the creation of China's first ever illustrated journals in 1884, the uh, Dian, Dian Shi Zai Journal. And critically, they didn't use woodblock printing to make this journal. They decided to use the newly imported technology of lithography. And this was the first step towards um, woodblock prints becoming obsolete in China. So it's probably a good place for me to stop talking. So I hope I've anyway shown you the range and variety of these prints and also how that by studying them, you can learn a lot about quite a few aspects of Chinese culture overall. And that's that, that's it.
Can you take a few questions? I'd, be, I'd love to take some questions if anybody has them. Please have some questions. Oh, well, I, I'll, I'll kick off. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, you. Amongst the New Year prints, mm. you, you showed, I think it was the fishing one. That yeah, the happiness had, of fishing. Uh, happiness, and another one which was lovely blues and had been hand-painted. Yes. Mm. And you said they were about a metre big. Mm. So they didn't really have what sort of message was... I mean, oh. the other ones had mess or yeah. messages that explained. I was just wondering what message was yeah. bit behind them, because they're quite big. Um, you know, a, a meter by. They were partly sort of just wallpaper, sort of decoration, oh, okay. but they yeah. do. They've all got meanings. I mean, they're all. But in the same way that we could just put up a cheerful picture, um, without necessarily, the artist might have intended a meaning. I don't know if everybody really paid that much attention, but they've all got meanings. So the the um, I suppose the one of uh, the legend of White Snake is a tragic romance. Oh, right. So you know, it's 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 romantic. So it's, it, that's nice. The um, um, there's the one of Yufei, the general. That's loyalty, you know, patriotism. You know, remember to be patriotic. Um, and so uh, the happiness of fishermen is really, I think, just um, I, I've seen a few other prints of the happiness of fishermen, and I think it was just seen as a sort of idyllic lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You get back to simplicity, you know, forget all the complicated things. Just live with a fishing rod and catch your own food, and you don't have to worry too much about anything. Do you think um, they were used as sort of inspiration for yeah. storytelling mm. in the house? I mean, because you had the one of Abs cartoons. Absolutely. Yes. I think it's a way of, uh, again, it, it was a way of passing on these popular stories and legends mm -hmm. uh, to children. Mm -hmm. You know, they could say, what's this picture about? And then you tell them what it's about. And that's a way of, as you say, passing on. And, and of course, they would have had quite a long life then and be... Actually, you know, no. no. They, I think some of them, I mean, the, this sort of print would literally have been stuck right. up outside. So the, right. very little currency. Okay. And they're all of contemporary events. So there's no point in them lasting a long time. And in fact, this, this is how contemporary they were. All this print, except for that corner mm. and this title, uh, were used earlier for a totally different battle nice. inside Korea. If you look here, you see this guy's wearing a black hat. Mm -hmm. In the original picture, it's very clearly a Korean court hat. And the action has taken place about a year earlier when the Chinese forces were still fighting in Korea. And it's the reuse of this design. And they've actually chopped off another woodblock and, and oh, sorry. Uh, oh, uh, no, it is working. I just don't know how to. So this bit has been and this part here have been chopped out of a completely different print block, possibly after the wood block disintegrated. They've cannibalized another one so they can reuse this for a totally different battle. Um, so that you can see that these events were very contemporary. The prints weren't meant to last a long time at all. It's one of the reasons, even though they were made in such vast numbers, very, very few of them have survived, uh, certainly from the 19th century. And as you go back 18th century and beyond, they're very rare indeed. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, ah, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, that's really, that is an excellent question. I, I mean, I've bought a lot of them in uh, at auction in the UK. Um, some of the older ones, like this, I got a few years ago in an antique shop, and I didn't pay a huge amount of money, but now they're, in the last five or ten years, as, as you know, there's lots of uh, uh, collectors tastes in China particularly change, and stuff that 10 years ago people were throwing away and giving away are now worth a lot of money. But the day-to-day the -day prints that were maybe made into the 1950s, firstly, they're extremely difficult to date because the paper they're made from ages really fast. So I've got a print of the kitchen, a beautiful big print with faded colors of the kitchen god and his wife. It looks like it's from the 19th century, but it's got a date because it's got a calendar at the top from 1989. So it looks ancient. This one I know is 1894 because that's when the battle was. Um, and this block was later cut up again and reused with different parts. So I know this was from 1894. A lot of the time it isn't that relevant because they're, they're not actually even worth that much, you know. So it's not like people are trying to pretend that they're old. The problems are that nowadays people are using other artistic techniques such as screen printing to make them. And it can be difficult to tell the difference between screen prints and block prints. And I don't like that because I, 
you know, the rationale is we're preserving the images, the culture. And my answer to that is, well, I could buy a book of photographs with them in it. You know, it's the whole process of woodblock printing that is under threat in China. Preserving the image just as it's using another method doesn't really save woodblock printing. So, yeah, it's important to me that they're made of, that they're actually real woodblocks, but generally the age isn't that important. I'm more interested in the content. I like the pictorial ones that actually have got a story that you can, you know, investigate. Yeah. So, yeah. In, in limited numbers, they are still being used, but they're not, um, I mean, like in the old days, they were made in millions. Everybody had them and they were from cheap designs to ones with gold paint that were very expensive and would have been put up in a rich house and still only lasted a few months, you know. But um, no, really nobody's, uh, there are studios still making them, but that one of the, uh, the Legend of White Snake, the very big one with the, all the action going on, the design is 19th century. Um, it was actually made, that one in the 1980s, during a, especially by a woodblock printing studio that made the original. Um, but they only made them then, just that once. So even that reprint is, is a very unusual one. And the, the one of the cityscape with all the new things in it um, from 1911, that was printed from the original woodblock, but again, it's a modern print. So they're made in very limited numbers nowadays, just to, as tourist souvenirs, really. With the museum? Uh, Some of them do, yeah. There are woodblock printing museums in China. But as I say, you've got to be careful they're not just screen printing them, that they're still actually making woodblocks. Some of them are making, you can, you know, they're making really exquisitely made ones that have taken a lot of time. They're only making very small numbers of prints and they can cost you quite a lot of money, but they're, but they're not made like like they used to be. It's not a, it's not really a big commercial industry anymore. Well, uh, I shall release you. Well, but thank you. It was wonderful, a uh, wonderful talk. Well, I learned a lot and uh, tremendous pictures and very very interesting stories to each of the images. So thank you. We we have some in our own collection, and uh, we also have. Um, the, the French, uh, you know, the, the, the con conquering um, um, prince. We have yeah. a book, book up upstairs. I don't know if you knew that. I, I did. And there's actually the British Museum has probably got the largest collection of yes. these um, victory prints. The victory and prints yes. In combination with a museum in Japan, they, they've created a website that just shows the, the 1894 war with Japan in woodblock prints. <laughs> right. um, so there were a lot of them. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but actually, your prints here are a really good case in point on how difficult they are to date because they all look absolutely modern, but they were collected in the 1840s or 1850s, very, very early on. So, yeah, but they've just been kept in perfect condition. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, as well. um, you know, that was really wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, would everyone like to join us for a drink? And, uh, Yay. And you can ask questions <laughs> privately <laughs> to, 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 to.